You're now tuned in to the Desire to Trade podcast, a show where we bring you the best figures of the trading world and teach you how you can become a successful trader. This is your host, Etienne Kret. Etienne Kret here, Forex Trader, founder of Desire to Trade. Welcome to episode 108 of the Desire to Trade podcast. This week, I feel like I want to jump in right into the episode. It's an interview I recorded with Steve Patterson, a trader trading pretty much on every market possible. He has a very interesting perspective on how he decided what to trade, and I thought it might be interesting for you guys to learn about this on the podcast. Although I don't totally agree with everything shared in this interview, I think Steve has advice that can really make you reflect. With over 30 years of experience in the market, he clearly knows what it takes to be successful. And he also has walked the path himself. Without further ado, please help me welcome Steve Patterson. Steve Patterson, welcome on the podcast. How's it going today? It's going excellent. Thank you for having me, Etienne. Awesome. It's going to be a pleasure. And we just exchanged a couple of ideas before the podcast, and I'm super happy to have you on the show. You're in Toronto right now, right? I am. Actually, I'm just outside of Toronto in a suburb called Oakville. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a uh, part of the GTA. Awesome. So tell us a little bit what's going on these days in your life. What's going on these days? Uh, well, you know, there's so much going on. It's not even funny. <laughs> as far as personally goes, uh, I recently got engaged to a beautiful woman who I very much love. And she's been absolutely great. So we're actually celebrating our two-year anniversary coming up. Nice. Cool. Yeah. That's nice. And usually the first question I ask my guests, and I didn't ask you first, but what is one quote that inspires you? That inspires me for trading or inspires me for life? Anything. I guess trading or life, whatever you prefer. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, I guess a quote that I use quite a bit, especially in trading, is a quote by uh, Albert Einstein. And that is to keep things simple, but not too simple. And I think that's very applicable when it comes to trading and to life. I like it. I think it makes a lot of sense to me, but we'll try to see how you apply it in the market. So tell us a little bit trading wise, what you're doing these days. Are you trading the markets actively? Oh yes, very, very actively. I'm at my computer from 6.30 in the morning until you know, sometimes 11 o'clock at night. I don't know what I would do if I wasn't trading. I think I would probably die. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always working on this business. And that's one of the things I love about it is that this industry allows you the ability to take out of it as much as you put into it. And it's something that I really preach. And that is, you know, like if you're going to be a professional trader, you have to stay on top of the curve so much because everything is constantly changing and you really do have to do the extra hours of you know screen time and if you're not trading you should actually be you know studying as to you know what should you be doing the next day the next week etc mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely and one thing that i'm pretty impressed about is that you just told me you traded everything which is i think fascinating yeah well, that's the thing. When I say I trade anything, I'm, I'm a very big believer. I have another saying that might be applicable here, but I always tell my students, I'd rather be rich than smart. And what I mean by that is that way going back way, way, way in the day, you know, 1985, 1986, I was very committed to being in what used to be a very active market back then called the OEX. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a derivative of the S&P 500. And they were the most heavily traded instrument back then. They were options. And way back in the day, I was just committed to be being an OEX expert, which would kind of like being the uh, e-mini contract kind of took over or something more popular. But I was like, well, you know, I want to be an OEX expert. And of course, you're trading the big board. And for people who come into trading, I think they get really hung up on one thing, meaning that they want to be very good at one thing. And I think that's okay. But if you were kind of stupid like me back then, 
if you pick the hardest thing, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna bleed in a tremendous amount of money because your competition is so much harder. And you're trading against the smartest minds, the best algos these days are trading the S&P 500. So if you're going to trade the S&P 500, you better make sure that you're super, super smart and you know it inside and out. Mm -hmm. So what I prefer and where I've kind of come full circle is I consider myself to be kind of like, uh, can I use a bad word on your podcast or no? Sure. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Okay. I, I kind of consider myself to be a little bit of a slut because <laughs> I go to where the easiest money is. And that's one thing that I, I try to teach people. Don't be a hero. Don't try to be smart. Get rich first. I always tell my students, before you try to do the hard things, make your first million dollars, right? Do the simple things that are going to build your account. Take the easy trades. Don't try to master everything in the very beginning. Have a bread and butter. So to answer your question, what do I trade? Mostly, for example, during earnings season, if it's an easy earnings season, meaning that most companies are going to beat or most companies are going to miss and they're either gonna, it's either going to be a lot of up or a lot of down, I will spend a lot of time trading equities. Right now, I'm kind of shifting a little bit away from equities because the period between August and September is going to be very slow, I think. But based on today, I don't know anymore. <laughs> and, you know, the Forex market should get a little bit more active. But the point I'm trying to make is that, yeah, I go to where the money is. If I see volatility in one area that's easy to exploit, I will trade equities, I will trade forex, I will trade options, I will trade penny stocks, I'll trade bonds, I'll trade gold. You know, if we're having a big bull market in gold like we did a couple of years ago, I'll trade that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, you know, when Bush was in power for, you know, for four years, I traded nothing but oil because the oil markets were moving and it was a place where I could make a lot of easy money. Mm -hmm. So. Does that change every single day or is it something you reevaluate every quarter or every few months to change the market? Um, that's a good question. You know, if I pay attention to news at all, I try to, uh, you know, trying to keep the noise out of trading and not pay too much attention to the news. But when I do read Bloomberg, when I do look at publications, I'm mostly interested in what the media is paying attention to about a certain topic. So, you know, for example, if Tesla was making a lot of news because of some controversial thing, you know, I'll pick that up in the news and I'll look at Tesla. If oil stocks are in the news every day, then, you know, I'll kind of go to the oil market and see what they're paying attention to. And so, It's something that changes on a daily basis sometimes, but overall, I'd say, you know, I try to stick with something for, you know, a couple of months to a quarter at minimum. Mm -hmm. But right. it's still kind of staying away from the news. Am I trying to stay away from the news? Yeah. Yeah, I think the news is a double-edged sword because there's so much noise, uh -huh. right? And The reality is this, the reality is all good traders know the news before it happens, meaning that I have been bearish on the S&P right now for the last, well, since the beginning of the month, I've been bearish and, you know, I've been posting that on stock twits quite a bit. And, you know, now the market's had two huge 1% down days and it was before, you know, the North Korean thing. And it was before today when Trump was tweeting about the thing. So the news is saying it was North Korea. And the news is saying, well, it's, you know, Trump losing 12 things. But the reality is that the fundamentals should usually tell you what's going to happen. And then the news comes along afterwards and makes up an excuse for it. So the reason the market's very volatile right now has nothing to do with North Korea and has nothing to do with Trump really at this point in time. That's the excuse that the media has. So mm -hmm. when you look at the news, It, sometimes you're very late to a situation. But when I do look at news, I'm looking for repetitive stories. 
I'm looking for stories that are continually being repeated over and over. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of what made you bearish on the S&P these past, like since the beginning of the month? Sure. I use a lot of fundamental analysis. And so in my fundamental analysis, I watch specifically, you know, I watch the economic data that's coming out. And what I do is I keep very accurate records of exactly what all that economic data is doing. And what I then contrast it against, like I contrast it against, especially during earnings season, if I'm, let's say, bullish on the overall economy and the overall market, and I see a lot of big names coming out that are beating expectations, but the stock is going down, or they're missing expectations and the stock is going higher, or they're beating expectations and the stock is going higher. I kind of look for that pattern, right? So if you'll notice, every earnings season will have a pattern. You know, every company will beat and every stock will go higher. And what was actually happening right now is that a lot of companies were beating, the expectations were kind of crummy, but a lot of companies were beating. And even if they were going higher, they were being punished. Okay. In other words, they were selling off. Even if they were gapping higher, they were selling off into it. So what that was telling me was that these good earnings that were coming out were being sold into. So when I started seeing that happen in second quarter earnings that just finished, I saw a number of companies that were beating expectations and were either, they were even gapping lower. There were several instances where companies were gapping lower. And so it just told me that the large institutions were using the fundamental information to sell into it. And that's a very, very, very bad sign because that means that, you know, they're not accumulating, they're distributing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that tells so you that, that probably the S&P is going to do the same thing as, as the stocks. Exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. That tells me that. That kind of gives me the overall picture as to, you know, is the smart money buying or is the smart money, you know, using this existing strength to take profits? Mm -hmm. And it's just a very, very accurate idea. Now, will it continue to sell off? You know, we don't know that. But mm -hmm. and what usually happens is usually the broader market will move at the end of the earnings season. And we're just finishing this earnings season right now. So uh, I think we have like a, you know, three or four more days and then really nothing. So usually the smart money will see how the market reacted to the numbers and then they'll adjust their models to basically say, okay, we should be taking profits here or we should be accumulating. Mm -hmm. Cool. And once you've decided on either a market or an instrument to trade, do you have any favorite way of trading? Is it trend trading or kind of reversal trading or does it varies? Well, yes and no. Like I said earlier, I've been kind of short a very, very difficult market. The S&P, it's an all-time highs. Now, I think everything, one of the things that I really believe in is what I call context. Mm -hmm. So what I actually teach my clients is how to read and understand the, uh, the context of a situation. Now, what that means is that, yes, there are times when a market is going to be trending in either an up or a down fashion, and you always want to be going with that smart money. You never really want to be fighting it. However, there is opportunity sometime to recognize when the smart money is changing. And so it then comes down to a time frame issue because, you know, what looks like a strong trend on a daily on a 30 minute chart might actually be a downtrend. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it really depends on the context of the situation. But Again, my number one, I probably should have given you this as my number one quote, and that is, I'd rather be rich than smart. And so typically, especially with my clients, I tell them never, ever, ever fight any existing trends. Even if you think it's a change, it's still easier to go to a market that is getting beaten up 
If you think the market's topping and you think we're going to go into a bit of a sideways or potentially even a bear market, which I think longer term we're about to go into, it's still better to stick with stocks that are getting hammered, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once I make a decision as to what I think is happening, I'm really a trend trader at the end of the day where I will always look. I never buy breakouts or anything like that. I'm always looking for you know, a pullback into that trend, even if it's on a shorter time frame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. And I'm going to guess that the courtesy pairs of the stocks that are going to be sideways are going to be, you're probably going to avoid them. Is that right? No, there's lots of opportunity in that, Etienne. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity in that. You know, I do very, very much like well, what you're talking about is a balance area if we talk about market profile, where, you know, a lot of people call it consolidation, but a market profile term is balance, which means that there is an equal balance between buying and selling pressure. Now, I do love balance areas very, very much. They're one of my favorite environments or contexts to trade in because you can have a very clean and clear idea of where you're right and where you're wrong. So sometimes when you're trading a, a trend, you know, the retracement can go deeper than you're expecting. And that can get a little tricky because when you're trading with a trend and you get, let's say you're expecting a shallow retracement and it goes a little bit deeper, you have the tendency or traders have the tendency to, you know, kind of make excuses and not take losses as quick. And But when you're trading with balance areas, which is a, a sideways market, you know exactly where you're wrong, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's got a clear structure to it. And I actually love them quite a bit. They don't offer as many opportunities because really, if you look at a balance area, there's probably on the top and bottom, there's probably about, let's say a balance area is like two months long. Mm -hmm. During that two month period, there might only be four opportunities to trade that, right? Because you, you got to wait for it to get to the top or the bottom. <laughs> you can't diddle around in the middle. But um, yeah, I do like balance areas as well. Cool. And let's get technical a little bit. Do you have any favorite tools that you use in the market? Some indicators, some patterns that you like to look for? No, I'm actually probably the i'm the antichrist of those things okay. so, so i'm curious uh, to know why why because i lost hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to make them work okay and and they never did uh, you know everything that you're reading on patterns and indicators right now i probably invented it it's so funny because I see so many people that trade patterns and, you know, for, for like probably seven years, I traded nothing but patterns, flags, pennants. I made them popular way back in the day. You know, I'm the one that probably made them so popular because I was on many forums back in the day promoting them when everybody was saying they didn't work. So I don't trade any patterns whatsoever because, A, I lost a lot of money trading it over the long run. And B, I also did many and researched many very proven mathematical studies that they are completely unreliable, mm -hmm. totally unreliable. Now, there are some exceptions with some larger term patterns, like, you know, on larger time frames, like a daily time frame. There are some exceptions to that. But over a big enough sample size, all patterns will break down. Some will work for a little while, depending on the context of the situation. And then they'll stop working completely and you'll lose all your money. So anything that you make will be just given back because when you're trading a pattern, you don't really know when the context is going to change. In other words, let's just say right now we've been in a, a very cyclical bull for seven years. So if you bought any flags quote unquote, it's a pattern, right? If you bought any flags, you made a whole lot of money. But it's not because flags worked. It's because the environment was very conducive to flags working, just to give you an example, because it's been a bull market. But this has been in a very unusual seven years, and it's been very consistent in its bull. You know, in 37 years of trading, I've never seen such a long market that was so consistent 
in its net outcome. So the answer to your question is I don't use those things because they're unreliable and they're not quantifiable. And there are times when they'll work really, really well for, and you don't know when that's going to change. Like if you're trading patterns, you'll just be trading them and you won't know that it's going to change. Mm -hmm. So you could, could be doing something for a long time, make a lot of money, and then in three months, you'll lose all that money because it just fails over and over and over again for three months. I think that's a really good reminder for sure, because I know yeah. some people who are stuck with that and probably have been like guilty of that myself in the past and maybe even like more recently. So what is the solution then? The solution is, oh, excellent question. The solution is very simple. It's again, going back to Albert Einstein, but complex. The solution is to have something that you can contextualize. In other words, you have to have something that adapts to chaos, okay? Meaning that how do you have something that adapts to chaos? Well, the market is not completely chaotic. If it was completely chaotic, there wouldn't be any trends whatsoever. There wouldn't be any balance areas. There wouldn't be any retracements. There wouldn't be any breakouts. It's not completely chaotic, but it's chaotic the majority of the time. And so what you need to have is you need to have a process that recognizes when it's not chaotic and exploitable and has specific biases directionally or even in a balance area and times when it is chaotic. And so I spend most of my time saying no, 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 no. I can look at a hundred stocks on any given day and I might only say yes to two of those stocks because they're operating and showing behaviors of non-chaoticness where the other 98 are completely chaotic and there is no agreement to what that stock should be doing by all multi-time frame players, right? So what I'm trying to look for is I'm looking for uh, specifically, I'm looking to see that the market maker is doing something. I'm looking to see that the hedge funds that are between, I call it the chain of command, that the hedge funds that are between you know, $10 million to $20 million are doing something. The traders that are throwing around you know, $50 million to $100 million are doing something. And the traders that are doing, you know, $100 million to a billion dollars, that they're doing something. So what I'm looking for specifically is I'm looking to look for their participation in a market so that I can lean against them. I don't want to be fighting anybody. I'm trying to take the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And how do you apply this to the Forex market? Well, Forex market's a little bit different than equities because in the Forex market, you have another big, big, big player, and that's the central banks, mm -hmm. right? So the central banks will actually participate in the market in very, very indirect ways, but they're going to be affecting the money supply that the intrabank market has. So they might not be buying and selling. Sometimes they are. But you have very, very big, big players in the Forex market. And because of that, that's what creates larger trends in the Forex markets over the stock market as a generalization. Not always, but as a generalization, uh, the Forex market will move more trendy than the equities markets will. So in the Forex market, you have to adapt it. And again, going back to your original questions, what do I trade? Forex is, is one of the harder markets to trade. Uh, if you were to say to me, what should everybody, if you want to make the most amount of money, what should you be trading? You should be trading equities because in equities, you have 5,000 that you can choose from on any given day. And so therefore, even if you're trading a pattern, like let's just say you're a pattern trader, what's the chance of finding a pattern of 5,000 equities versus trading the forex market which is really only six countries right right, right. i mean there's I, yes there's cross currencies but at the end of the day it's you know the united states canada great britain the eurozone australia and that's really just about it you know <laughs> maybe new zealand right oh and switzerland right so in the forex market you've got six things to choose from that you have to be 
extra, what I call a poker terminology called nitty, meaning you have to be much more patient in the Forex market to find the you know, ideal situation. Mm -hmm. So what would be your advice for people who want to trade exclusively Forex, meaning only Forex and not other stuff? My advice would be get used to a lot more pain. Okay. Okay. <laughs> because you're, you're going to have it, you know, uh -huh. and or develop a lot more patience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you, like, mm -hmm. I'm not a very patient person. And, you know, I when I turn on my computer every day, I want to start my day off making $500 to $1,000 in the first hour. I'm not patient, right? And so that's why equities allow me that luxury. If you try to do that in a Forex market exclusively, you're going to get your butt handed to you, you know, because it's just not going to work out for you very, very well because there's just not going to be ideal conditions. There's going to be too many instances where chaos is ensuing. And if you're trying to trade in chaos, it ain't, it's not going to work for you. Yeah. You know, you're going to get stopped out way too much. So if you want to trade the Forex markets, my advice is to develop a lot of patience and know when is a really great learn how to differentiate between a really good situation and just an average situation awesome i think that's really powerful and the other topic i want to discuss with you is the idea of a uh, kind of trader development so how traders become better i know you're really kind of keen on one-on-one -on -one coaching which i also think is powerful why do you see coaching as being better than a course or a training or just a book? Excellent question. And I'm going to kind of turn to my own experiences with this. Sure. But even though I'm going to talk about myself, I found it to be very universal. And when I first went into the industry, you know, starting from day one, I, I dropped out of high school and I said, I want to be in finance. And I went downtown to Bay Street and I said, give me any job. And Bay Street is Canada's version of Wall Street. So I said, give me any job. And they said, well, what are your qualifications? I said, I don't have any. <laughs> and, they said, <laughs> and they said, okay, you're going to be a messenger. And I said, okay, great. So what they did was day one, they said, okay, you're hired. Now, here's another messenger that's been a messenger for the last five years follow him around for six months and do everything he tells you to do. And so that's what I did. And then I got a promotion and I became what's called a dividend clerk. And when I got the promotion, they said, here's a dividend clerk that's been a dividend clerk for, for the last five or six years. Do exactly what he tells you to for the next six months. And I did that. And when I became a stockbroker, it was the exact same thing. I went and worked for free for an entire year for the number one producer on the street. I didn't even not take a salary. I worked for free because I knew that if I learned from somebody who was the best at it directly, watch what they did every day, got the nuances, talk like them, walk like them, wear the clothing that they wore. And I'm, I'm not joking. I did that. You know, I believe, I think Tony Robbins calls it emulation, right? Wow. I emulated what that successful person was doing, and then I made it my own. And then I got hired as one of the youngest stockbrokers ever without a university education. And then when I went and worked on the floor, I did the same thing. If this guy told me to go get coffee, I'd go get coffee. If he told me to, to get his laundry, I got laundry. And so my point is this, in the entire financial industry, even if you graduated from Harvard and you got a job at Goldman Sachs, guess what they're going to do? Yeah, they're going to they're gonna gonna, be trained. Yeah. They're going to be trained. And guess how they train you? They don't sit you down in a classroom. They sit you beside a senior person that is doing that job. The entire financial industry is based upon the apprenticeship system, in, and it always has been and always will be. Because there's so many nuances to this business, you have to see the contextual situations over and over and over again in order to truly learn something. So many retail traders out there, I feel so bad for them because they don't have that opportunity to really, even if you're in a chat room, you don't really get to talk to that mm -hmm. trader. You really don't get to ask them questions. And in my coaching, 
I'll give you an example. Back in 2013, I coached for a company called Compass FX, and we taught 300 students. Okay. And it was a big group environment. And um, of those 300 students, I've kept in touch with a lot of them. And only about four or five out of that 300 ended up going on to really super success. Wow. That's that's pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I don't know about the rest, but for the most part, I know that four or five went on to success. And guess who those four or five were? They were the guys that asked me a million questions, right? Mm -hmm. And one of those guys runs a multi-million dollar fund right now, and he would come to my house to sit with me. So just one more quick way to explain it. Now, with my existing program that's one-on-one, I stopped doing the group coaching because I felt terrible for taking people's money and not giving them the results that I felt I should give them for giving me money. I felt I felt really guilty. I was like, man, this sucks, right? I know I gave them value, but I would have felt a lot better if a lot more became profitable. So I said, look, this doesn't work very well. What I've got to do is I've got to offer a way where not only do I teach you by literally me teaching you what I need to teach you, but I got to have feedback from you. And I got to see if what you're doing is working or not. And so in my existing program, I have students that are with me for a year and two years, and they show me every single trade. And so I can look at that trade. I can say, okay, this is what you did right. This is what you did wrong. Here's what you need to fix. And I can work with them individually. Again, the apprenticeship program. Now, my success ratio with my existing students is over 80% with those students that have stayed with me for over a year. And with my students that are with me for over two years, I'm almost 100%. I'm like 90, 91, 92%. Not everybody can trade. And even the students that dropped out and aren't trading anymore, they've come to me and they've said, Steve, thank you so much. And I'd be like, but yeah, but you're quitting. And they were like, yeah, but I just learned that this business is just not for me. And I could have wasted another, you know, five years of my life guessing, reading books, you know, doing these other silly things. But now that I see everything that this business takes, I don't like it and I don't want to do it anymore. And, you know, even my students that quit, they're really happy and we're best of friends, right? So Mm -hmm. that's why I believe that if you can get an opportunity to work with a mentor under an apprenticeship program, you know, do everything that you can to make that happen. Because it's the only way that not the only way, but it's one of the best ways that you'll shorten that learning curve, number one. Number two, you'll gain so much more confidence because how many times, Etienne, have you read a book or read about a strategy or something and then you've gone and applied it and now let's just say it works for like a couple of months, right? And you think it's great, right? Yeah. But then all of a sudden it stops working. And you're like, well, I don't know why it's not working anymore. And, you know, you read in the book, you can't talk to the guy that created it. You can't say, hey, you know, it's not working anymore. What do I do? Or what did you do? Or things like that. Like you just completely lose confidence, Mm -hmm. right? But if you can have feedback from the person that is teaching you something, then you can say, oh, okay, I, now I know what I did wrong. And if, if that educator cannot tell you exactly what you did wrong and cannot tell you exactly how to fix it, then find somebody else. Right. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I was going to say that it never happened because all the strategies I tried never worked from day one. So oh. <laughs> it's going to work out there. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's very interesting. And yeah. the problem I see with this is that many people are going to make excuse for why they cannot get coaching. And I guess like the first excuse is going to be the cost. But what other excuse do you see people have for not getting coaching or not getting a mentor? Well, 100% of it is money. Okay. You know, I mean, I think everybody would like a mentor, but I think 100% of it. Listen, 
it takes me so much time, Etienne. You know, I have to spend so much time. You know, probably per student, I have to spend a hundred to two hundred hours oh, yeah. over the course of a year. That's a lot of time, right? Even if it's not the coaching part, it's the following up, it's the chatting with you afterwards, it's the going over your trades. And now that's an exaggeration. But I'd say thirty to fifty hours I have to spend to get somebody to be a profitable trader. Mm -hmm. At least. So, you know, I make a good living from trading. So to justify that amount of time, I have to charge for it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, my fiance will leave me. <laughs> <laughs> and she's very beautiful and expensive. <laughs> and I don't want that. But yeah, I have to justify for that time. You know, maybe one day when I retire and I, you know, I, I have more than enough money to live off of for the rest of my life. You know, I would do it for free, but the bottom line right now is just because it takes so much time, you have to charge, I have to charge a lot of money, right? I wish I didn't, but <laughs> I do. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I see how many time, like how much time it takes to help people and to follow up. So for sure, I totally understand. Makes yeah. a lot of sense. Is there and anything also, we didn't cover in the interview that you would like to talk about or any, any lesson you think people need to get from you? Um, yeah, I think that I'd like to, you know, we've asked a lot of questions, but I'd like to give some value to the listeners right now. I don't think this should just be anything. And I think really the real value that I'd like to give to a lot of traders, whether you're new or whether you're a seasoned trader, if you're unsuccessful right now, that's really who I'm really addressing it to. If you're unsuccessful right now, my best advice that I can give you is to stay very optimistic, okay? You have to stay optimistic that there are people out there that are living and doing your dream. And you know it and you see it because, you know, you could, how many successful traders that are famous do we know, market wizards, you know, the big guys like Warren Buffett, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of examples of people out there. So stay optimistic that it's possible. However, Be critical of what you're learning, meaning that don't just accept something because somebody is telling you or flashing, you know, this big money in your face, right? Be critical, meaning that ask questions, ask a lot of questions like, what are you going to teach me? Why are you so different than everybody else? What makes your education like? Don't be shy. Even with my students, I find that my students, sometimes I'm like, I want to talk to my students for like an hour before they buy my course, because I want to get to know them. And I want them to know, have very, very realistic expectations of what is what this industry is, and what this industry isn't. And so even a lot of people, they just like, here, Steve, I'm going to pay you. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want your money yet. I want you to know everything that you need to know before you get involved. And I think so many people are just like, I just want to make money. And, you know, I see this guy posting trades out there and he's making money or he's got these other students that are, you know, saying they're millionaires and they're making money. Well, find out you know, why is that? Why is that one student so much different than the other 90 that he taught? Right? Ask a lot of questions before you decide or buy anything. Do a lot of research on if it's something for you. You know, I have so many people that, you know, they're in the Forex markets because they just got something in their head about the Forex markets, but they shouldn't be in the Forex markets. They should, they should be trading something else, right? I know, I know some guys that are giving an example. I had a student that was a, uh, he was in insurance business his whole life, right? And he was trying to trade the Forex markets. He spent his entire life in the insurance business. And then he spent five years trying to trade the Forex markets. And all he did was bleed money for five years. So when he came to me, And he said, you know, Steve, I want to learn Forex. I said, I, you know, I'm not going to teach you Forex because it's not working for you. However, I know you're in the insurance business. Do you know about options? And he said, yeah, well, I know about them, but I've, you know, I never thought about them. And I said, well, 
options are the insurance business. And I said, if you were very successful in the insurance business, then options are what you should be trading because he was a very analytical guy, statistical and mathematical. And he changed the options. And within one year, he made back every penny that he lost in five years trading Forex. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to what I say, ask a lot of questions, stay optimistic, keep an open mind. Don't just say, I'm an ES trader, I'm a, I'm a Forex trader, and I'm going to trade nothing but the euro. You've got to find out you know, what your strengths are, what you're good at. And that's the beauty of this business, Etienne. The yeah, beauty of exactly. this business is that there are so many ways to make millions of dollars, but you've got to find the way that is best for you specifically. And that's where asking a lot of questions in. Ask those questions. Ask the questions that relate to your strengths and your weaknesses. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of value also in trading what you know. And that's, I think, a powerful advice as well that you kind of gave. Yeah. So really, really interesting. So how can people find you if they want to connect with you or reach out and see what you're doing? Oh, excellent question. Thank you. Yeah, I offer a free 20-minute Skype consultation. So if anybody is interested in learning more, what I would suggest that you do is, first of all, go to my website, www.stevepattersontrading.com. Check out you know, just whatever's there. Look at the trades in my blog. Also, go to my YouTube channel. And again, look at my style of trading, okay? Look at the things that I trade. Look at how I'm trading them. I trade options. I trade Forex. I trade stocks. I day trade. I swing trade. Look at the things that you're interested in. Ask yourself a very important question, not whether or not you think I'm right or wrong. That doesn't matter. Ask yourself if it's something that you can see yourself being good at, okay? And if my style, including my personality, because I'm, I have a very specific personality, some people get along great with me, some people don't. So ask not only if my style, but if my personality is one that you can learn from, right? And then you know, then talk to me on Skype, reach out on Skype, SP Trader, uh, and I will actually go through my website and schedule a free 20 minute consultation. Doesn't cost a dime. We'll get to know each other. We'll talk about what you're trying to do specifically. And I'll tell you honestly, right off the bat, I turn people away because if I can't help you, any money that I make from you is bad karma. And I'm going to lose that money. So if I can't help you, my guilt about taking money from you is going to make me lose that money. So I spend a lot of time making sure, you know, is this somebody that I can truly help or is this somebody that, you know, needs somebody else? Yeah. So Steve, we have a question we ask the guests at the end of every podcast. If you could give only one piece of advice for traders in one sentence, what would that one sentence of advice be? Get the right expectations about what this business is and what is possible from this business. I think that's powerful. I usually tell people not to have any expectation, but having, yeah, good expectation is always better for sure. Trading is a profession and a career, and you have to approach it in the same manner as you would running any other business. And so that's what I mean by the right expectation. Nice. Steve Patterson, thanks for being on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you here. It's a very much a pleasure to meet you. And I do thank you for your time. And bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Desire to Trade podcast. To get all the information on this show, free articles, and unique resources, make sure to check out www.desiretotrade.com and subscribe. Please leave us a review and let us know what you thought about the show. It's time to become the best trader you can be. See you next time.